no, just as we were getting into the music, um, I want to say a couple of things right off the bat. Um, one is that we will send this deck out tomorrow. All right. So please don't feel if you miss something, um, you know, or if there's a particular resource that we mentioned that you just can't quite get to or get it out of the chat. Um, don't panic. It'll be in your inbox tomorrow. Um, another housekeeping item that I'd like to just address, if you wouldn't mind, let's keep the chat for kind of the passing along of links and resources. And then if you have questions, we absolutely encourage you to ask those. Um, we're gonna try to hit several of the ones that you may have asked upon signing up for the webinar, um, but we'll get to those at the end. But as your questions come to you, please feel free to put those in the Q&A feature. You should see that at the bottom um, Zoom bar of your screen, just like you would see the chat option. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we are so thrilled. I'm anything but lonely tonight. I'm joined by three all-star educators to talk about teaching ELA in a modern classroom. So we'll get started with quick introductions to the modern classroom instructional model. And then we'll dive right in. We're going to talk about exploring modern classrooms and we're going to look at two, um, really three, um, but you know, two uh, kind of two classrooms or kind of classroom designs tonight at the high school level and the middle school level in reading and writing. We're gonna dive kind of into how we explore um, examining a text and then how we work with an ongoing writing project in a modern classroom. Then we're gonna look at closer, a closer look at skill-based assessments, collaboration and discussion, differentiation and uses of video in a modern classroom. And then at the end, we'll take your questions and talk about how you can learn even more and get involved with the Modern Classrooms Project. Um, one quick thing that I just wanna say, we love elementary and emergent bilingual students. We absolutely love them. Um, problem is we only have one hour tonight. Um, so we did advertise this as a secondary ELA webinar, but if you are an elementary teacher, please don't go far. Keep an eye on our social media and keep getting those modern classrooms emails because we plan to do more spe elementary specific webinars, taking a deeper dive into reading, writing and math and specials, um, special blocks next school year. Same goes for emergent bilinguals. If you are a teacher who supports students who are learning English, um, we actually are going to have a dedicated webinar to that next school year as well. So if you are not familiar with the Modern Classrooms Project, we are a nonprofit organization that seeks to empower you, the educator, to meet every student's need through blended self-paced and mastery-based instruction. We lead a movement of educators around the world, um, and that's you. Teachers are the backbone of everything we do, and teacher authenticity is really um, a value that we hold near and dear. We believe that teachers drive change in the classroom and beyond. So um, my name is Kate. I work for the Modern Classrooms Project full-time. I'm a proud former high school social studies teacher. But more importantly, I am joined by some rock star English teachers or ELA teachers tonight, rather, who are also all actually modern classroom mentors. Um, so Alicia, I'll kick it to you first. So would you mind introducing yourself and then pick a buddy when you're done to introduce themselves next? Ooh, that's pressure. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Hi, my name is Alicia Cordero. I teach um, 11th grade currently at one of the largest high schools in Virginia. Um, I have taught every grade level between 9 and 12 and every combination of those levels from co-taught to AP. Um, and I truly was always just looking for something for the gaps. So in my presentation, I'll address kind of like where the gaps were for me. And the modern classroom was really something that filled that gap for me. It made me able to bridge the resources to the students in the way that I wanted to, especially in this very difficult year. Um, and um, I like uh, writing and long walks on the beach. And uh, <laughs> I'm gonna kick it over to Jackie for an introduction for her and her culture. Awesome, thank you, Alicia. My name is Jackie Durr. Uh, I co-teach actually with Elaine Milton, who's gonna introduce herself in just a second. And this year we teach eighth grade. I also teach a section of seventh grade. And in the summer I um, teach high school. So I do like a summer school for high school for credit recovery. So a little bit of sort of that, that sort of middle age group is kind of my wheelhouse years. Uh, who doesn't like to constantly be surrounded by teenagers? So um, 
this is my 15th year of teaching. And I, I honestly think that after finding the modern classroom model, my classroom has been more efficient and more productive, even in this quarantine year than at probably any of my other years. And so for me, um, I would highly recommend um, this, this model. And I'm, we're so glad that you're here so that you can learn a little bit more about it and, and implement it into your own classrooms. So uh, Elaine, I'm gonna toss it over to you. Hi, I'm Elaine Milton. I teach eighth grade English with Jackie Durr. Um, I've also taught seventh grade and love the middle school level. And I really just want to echo everything that she said. We've actually co-taught our classes this year, uh, which is new to us, but we've always worked together for a long time, but we're actually like together in the classroom um, implementing this model and have seen awesome success uh, with our students this year and very excited to share this with you today. I am so, so happy that the three of you are here with me. Um, I think, you know, the three of you kind of got to it and I experienced this myself as a teacher is just kind of the power of the modern classrooms instructional model. Um, we really believe in reshaping the teacher experience. We believe that when you can start with the teacher, empower the teacher um, to kind of create what you, like you said, those, those efficient systems. And we do that in our classrooms by focusing on leveraging blended learning to foster more of a human connection in our rooms. Um, and we think by focusing on the teacher, and we are going to then reshape the student experience and we are better able to differentiate, better able to uni uh, meet unique social emotional needs, which we certainly know we're gonna have a greater diversity of that um, as we open our doors physically next school year. Um, so now is the perfect time. If you haven't already taken our free online course, definitely encourage you to jump in. Um, the virtual mentorship program is definitely a way to kick it up a notch and get more personalized support. We'll talk about that at the end. We also do work with schools and school and district partners, if that's something that interests you. And we are currently launching our virtual summer institute. Registration is closing very quickly, if that's something you're interested in. I would take care of that sooner rather than later. You, a little bird told you that to take care of that quickly if that's something you're still interested in. If you're, if you're not familiar with the Modern Classrooms instructional model, let's start with the basics, just so you can follow along and get the most out of hearing about Alicia, Jackie, and Elaine's classrooms this evening. So through our research-backed instructional model, if you do like to read academic research, I just put a link in the chat that might be helpful. Um, we kind of start with, I like to say, cloning the teacher. I can, I've never talked to an educator that says, Meh, no, there's enough of me to go around for every single learner with all of their diverse learning needs in my classroom. I found that when I could create a library of instructional videos that I made, we want to leverage that teacher expertise. You've spent years refining your craft. You know how you want to teach fractions or, you know, if you're the math teacher, you know how you want to address the causes of World War I if you're the history teacher. You know, we think that we've spent years honing um, what we want for our students when we create our own instructional videos, we're not losing our authenticity in our classrooms. When we've cloned ourselves on videos, that frees us up to have self-paced structures in our classrooms. Learners can access content when they're ready for it and learn at their own pace within a unit of study. And then finally, with that self-pacing, this allows us to base, to, you know, base student progress on mastery not completion, not compliance, but we can truly give students and we can truly assess if they understand. And if they haven't mastered something, then we can give them meaningful opportunities to revise and reassess. Um, now, as we pointed out the modern classroom instructional model, I don't want anyone to think there's just one way of doing a lesson. You know, not every lesson maybe goes in that order of video, assignment, mastery check. Um, not every lesson's going to have a video even. Really no two modern classrooms are identical and teacher authenticity and expertise, like we said, is so central to everything we do here. Um, it's as our beliefs as a nonprofit and it's integral to our model itself. So tonight we're lifting up the voices of three of our ELA teachers, uh, but please know that they are part of a movement of thousands. If you are an ELA teacher on this call who's very familiar with the modern classroom instructional model, you might say, oh, I do this a little differently. And that's great. Um, we want you to take those tenants of blended self-paced mastery-based instruction and best serve your students. Um, but let's dive in to lifting up Alicia's great work. Um, I've, I'm somewhat familiar with this unit, Alicia, that we're going to be going through. We're kind of talking about reading text, 
and a longer writing project with this one. So tell us about your Indigenous and First Nations Literature Unit. So uh, I teach 11th grade and in uh, my school, our curriculum, it is the American Lit Survey. And so we do First Nations, Indigenous, all the way through hopefully getting to modern, early modernistic writings, depending upon how much time the state assessments and other assessments eat up. So in this unit for, for my students, they read a variety of works from the different Indigenous First Nations people to examine everyday life, their culture, their traditions, their customs and uh, the effects of the establishment of colonization. Uh, we also look for kind of the beginning patterns of storytelling, the beginning patterns of analysis. So some of the skills that we emphasize within this are predicting, questioning, evaluating, and connecting. Those are the kind of the core tenets of what they have to do for our state assessment. And in the 11th grade year, it's kind of what we wanna see from them happen organically as they're reading a text. Um, they have to use their knowledge at the end of this unit to answer a persuasive essay um, using evidence from the texts to support their position, which reflects and models the state assessment that we have here in the state of Virginia, which is actually called the SOL, um, Standards of Learning, for those of you who are wondering. So we're using a lot of skills at the same time in a very recursive structure. So for those of you who are familiar, and many of us are, it's a very innate thing to teaching, you kind of touch upon everything once a little bit, and then you go back and you build and you do it again in a scaffolded way, so that we have acquisition trading over to knowledge, which is applied learning. Um, so lots of stuff. We can move on to the next slide. I, I think I'm, I'm set here. So we'll start off with kind of our trickster myths. Uh, this is the sample that I gave Kate. So in this particular lesson, units will either open the um, attached sheet if they're virtual or they'll come get one in physical if they're in class. Um, and they have some options. So the, the video here is an Ed puzzle. And it has some reading check comprehension questions. So for me, I'm going to kind of run you through what this would look like in a classroom. My classroom, my first period of 32 kids last year, the Lexile level for those students ranged from 790 to 1700 plus. And this is what I'm speaking to when I say filling the gaps. So the kid who's 1700 plus is real bored. And the kid who's 790 is really struggling to try and keep up and build on what they have. So we can either give the video link out and have the sheet and make allow them to watch it, review, go over analysis, or I can have the student with maybe a lower comprehension, watch the video, do the reading checks through Edpuzzle as they're going through, then take the analysis sheet and go back over the stories again, a second time in viewing and then they can fill in the analysis sheet that way. So students are assessed on their comprehension of the text and application of skills such as setting, conflict, personification, protagonist, antagonist, and moral lessons. Um, my The mastery check, and this would be considered the mastery check for the viewing of this video and the review of these stories, allows students to reflect on what they learned and ask questions on what we may not have been able to cover in class whole group. Um, in addition to that, it allows me to parse up the classroom into different learning groups. So there's that built-in differentiation um, and kind of allow students to be more flexible in terms of what they would prefer. We would often read the trickster myths. I have copies of them. We would break it up and we do chunks and A would do this story and this story and this. Sometimes videos are just really great even for the later grade students. Everyone loves a good visual. Everyone loves a colorful picture. And Crash Course, many of you know, they do a great job with their animations. And the students really love these stories because most of them have to do with animals pooping. So they just love the idea of, oh my gosh, this is so funny. And they get into it a lot. So this was how we would apply the structures of the modern classroom within one class that's supposed to be an honors level, but is broken up through the differentiation of needs. It also then would allow me to circulate the room, maybe spend more time with the kid who's a 790 Lexile, make sure they're on board, and then ask the other students who are engaged to do the aspire to do. So for this particular unit, my aspire to do is to create your own creation myth. 
I have a little note that it has to, doesn't have to do with poop, but most of them choose to put some sort of poop anecdote in there, which is real fun. Um, but there's an authentic engagement. I'm not forcing them to be excited about this story or think it's funny. They're finding out whether or not they're into it. And then they're showing me through multiple means how they can apply their skills. And so this mastery check, if they do an aspire to do, leads to another mastery check, the creation of that story. And I can see real time application of skill. You know, Alicia, that just reminded me of a, a kind of a common misconception. I think that people sometimes have about the modern classroom instructional model is um, that we can't use outside video uh, because and we do very much emphasize that, you know, research shows that students do respond best to their own teacher on the video, their teacher's voice. But I would do things like this all the time. If, for instance, there was a there was a TED uh, a TED Ed for, on, um, I know there was a great one, an animated one on the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you know that in that in that unit was perfectly appropriate, and it was so visual in such a creative way, um, and the really the learning the learning really stuck. Um, with that video, you know, so while you're going through the virtual mentorship program, we absolutely, you know, your mentor is going to say like, oh, please create your own video. You know, we, we want to make sure that you are leaving modern classroom professional development with that skill, because most of the videos you create will, you know, most of the videos your students see rather will be videos you create. But I think this is a great example of, you know, it's, you can engage them with something different and fun. Yeah, I had this really great conversation with my mentor, who happens to be Kate, if you were wondering. It was way back when. Uh, and <laughs> I did say, you know, I don't see the point of reinventing the wheel on this. And it is a nice little break from them hearing my voice, which I have to be quite honest, I do apologize when you have to hear it. It does <laughs> break no, me. No. But I think it's nice for them to see, you know, out in the world, here's how you apply a real life skill of finding something that meets your understanding. Yeah. Um, and that that's okay. It's not like cheating. Yeah. Absolutely. So the, the big text for us in this particular unit is the middle five by Francis LaFleche. Lexile is between like a 790 and a 900. So it's a real good middle school grade book, which is how I sell it to these 11th graders. Like you should be able to get through this. Um, so we chunk it four chapters at a time. There are 16 chapters. And what I have them do is I keep a thematic journal. So my cousin, I come from a family of teachers. I'm real lucky. And a lot of them are English teachers. And I was asking my cousin, um, for something for another book that I was doing. And she gave me this template, which is called a thematic journal. Some of you may know about it, some of you may not. So you can see the little graphic on the left-hand side. It's categorized there for the students where they're gonna put the chapter and the page number. They're gonna put the quote directly from the text, copy paste. They're gonna have from the theme, they're gonna need to pick a quote or excuse me, a theme for that quote. So they can't just willy nilly spark notes it and slap something down and be like, did it. Um, they have to tell me what the significance is. They have to explain why that's an important quote in this chapter or in this book as a whole and what it's showing us. And then they have to do a connection, text to text, text to self, text to world. And we often go over what those things mean. They get really excited when they're like, this reminds me of this scene from Gossip Girls. Am I allowed to use that for my connect? Yes, yes, you are. Just explain it to me. How, what, how does Blair figure into this? Uh, so they get very, very excited. And much like the short stories, I get to decide how I break up the room. For some kids who have IEP 504 accommodations, instead of doing two per chapter, they do one. Or they'll do one for every other chapter, or they'll I'll modify this particular chart um, specifically for their needs. But the instructional video walks them through how to use this, and these are the you know self-created videos that the students get from us, um, and it allows them to go back. So for students who really do have that organizational issue, they can go back and go, okay, wait, what, what was I supposed to be doing again? I forgot. I think I did it right the last time. Um, and so then I can say, all right, all you kids, you're all moving towards this. So you can work together on this. Collaboration is really key. And they get very excited when they can work together. And one of the things that you'll experience, it's very odd, is you'll see a lot less cheating happening in your classroom and or very, very poor attempts at cheating because we know they're not good at it. Um, but they do get very excited when you give them permission to work together because they do feel like they're cheating a little bit. Oh my God, we can read this together. We can talk together about it. It's like, yes. 
then that organically builds trust within the classroom. You see these lovely partnerships and these groupings start to build with that engagement. Um, so it, it's kind of great. And then at the end of their whole unit here, so at the end of the 12 lessons, they're working through an SOL style essay. So it's persuasive in nature. Some say a person's identity is defined by his or her culture and traditions. Others say it's their actions, take a position. Blah, 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 blah. I'm so tired of saying it because they just had the test last week and we reviewed so much for it. <laughs> um, but they, they then get a scaffolded, scaffolded packet. So this is the first big paper that they're doing for me, even though it's not really big, it's very formulaic. We know that standardized testing doesn't allow for creativity or an imagination, as Jackie and I were discussing before we started here. Um, and they're looking for check marks. So we're walking students through how to do these check marks. And I'm getting students from ages. I am co-chair of my department. I got to say, best English department in the world. Absolutely love the people that I work with. But I'm getting different levels. I'm getting different levels of where we are in our skill set. So one of the practices that I use, and if you haven't looked this up, you might want to look up Step Up to Writing. Uh, my older sister is a teacher who specializes in the autistic uh, cluster in her school, and she uses it to help them get to writing a paragraph. Very effective for my students who really might struggle with body paragraphs or just paragraphs in total, like what do I put in it? I have ideas, but I don't know how they're supposed to go. So my two instructional videos here walks them through what each part of the packet is, but first they have to go through the guided practice of step up to writing. So instead of me doing this whole group, and I did this whole group last year, I can tell you this particular recording and having them walk through was so much more successful because they could go back and go, wait, what? And then go back again and look at what they're doing. And okay, did I get the point? Did I get the evidence? Did I get the explanation? And then what's the list? And then go back again. And I can check students' progress of their understanding of the Peel strategy as they submit. One of the greater parts of the modern classroom is that it's already built in for revision, which is another thing that's gonna blow their minds. It's really great. Like, I can redo this again? Yes. Uh, and so we can have sit, we can have a discussion, we can go over what they've done, and they know where they are, I know where they are, and they feel more confident moving into that writing larger structure as a, as a whole. Yeah, Alicia, it's so funny because actually my first unit that I ever did as a blended self-paced mastery based unit um, as a social studies teacher, it was a writing unit. And I found the exact, we were working on a longer essay and I thought I found the same thing, that ability to put myself on video explaining really what we're looking for in a thesis statement. Um, my students there that the ability for them to go back, rewind me on that pause, work on it, hit play again. I got much much better writing. Um, so it, I'm glad to hear that your experiences echo that. It just it takes the like whack-a-mole out of the classroom where you're trying to, you know, meet everyone and you can just meet the needs of the students who really do need you and mm -hmm. not feel like you're ignoring everybody else. And I, I felt that I was getting pieces of pieces of the project as we went and we could and with the revision built in, we could address some of these things before I got an essay. It was like, what this is, what do we do with this? You know, it's the last day of the unit and what do we do? Yeah, it was it was much stronger final products. Um, Jackie and Elaine, I'd love for you to walk us through, you're gonna walk us through two units tonight. So one that focuses on text and then one that focuses on writing. They're shorter units, unlike Alicia's, which is a, you know, a longer unit that kind of does both. Um, so, you know, just as a reminder, um, you do teach eighth grade and can you remind us of the nature of how you're working together this year and then we'll jump in um, to talking about Edgar Allan Poe. I love I loved the game board from this unit. Absolutely. And actually just to even, you know, one of the things I think to always keep in mind when you're especially first starting to implement this model. And for me, it was like, well, I'm not helping these kids. And I kept forgetting that I was because they were already watching me on an instructional video or listening to Elaine on an instructional video. And those were the kids that only needed to hear it that one time that in a normal or more traditional setting, they were having to sit through me, you know, going through it 12 times with the student in the back who was, you know, doing who knows what, picking their nose for the first 15 minutes of class. And so, I think that for me, it was like, oh my gosh, this kid only needed to hear it that one time. So you're not, you are not 
not instructing those kids. Although some days it feels like, oh my gosh, I haven't, I haven't talked to that student in a couple of days, you know, and they are just really thriving on their own. So just to kind of throw that in there, because I know for me, that was something that I was like a little bit nervous at first. So the first unit that we're going to talk about was an, a unit on Edgar Allan Poe. Actually, one of the things that we study is like the, we, we do some author study and Elaine and I also teach in Virginia, same as Alicia. So, um, we were doing a unit on the Telltale Heart, which is like one of the anchor stories that in our particular um, school that we read. And so it's sort of it's sort of interesting because even uh, to, to hear Alicia talk about the things that they're doing in high school, we're sort of laying that groundwork in that middle school so that when they get to more complex texts and in high school, they have already built some of those skills. And so much of reading is really skill-based instruction. And so, you know, they're not going to comprehend the story if they don't have some of those foundational reading skills to put into place when they get there. And so we really focused in this unit on reading the text closely, reading it multiple times, like having to get through Edgar Allan Poe as an eighth grader was a really big challenge for some of our students. And we also have a, a tremendous range of lexiles within our students as well. Beyond that, we focused on identifying point of view. And really for us, as we started to sort of plan out these modern classroom units, it was like, okay, what are the essential skills that these kids need to know and, and can really use this particular text to apply and say, yes, I, I've got it. I can do it and, and demonstrate that to us. And so we focused on point, uh, identifying point of view, summarizing with some text support, and then being able to go back to the text and say, and this is how I know that that is the answer. Mm -hmm. And so really doing that like close reading to, to sort of lay that ground that groundwork of then being able to, when they get to high school say, here is what I feel and what I know, and here is the reason that I was able to come to that conclusion. So the first unit that we, or the first lesson that we really worked on um, with them when we started reading The Telltale Heart was point of view. And so we created an instructional video that kind of walked them through identifying narrative point of views, all of the different types. Um, and how to pick it out in the text, like how to identify like what point of view are we looking at here? So like focusing on the pronouns or understanding, um, you know, which characters thoughts and feelings do we know? Or do we not know any characters thoughts and feelings and kind of identifying those things um, in our instructional video. Um, and then they had a practice and we provided them with a cheat sheet. So I know Alicia was talking about like, they feel like they're cheating. When we call our little note sheet a cheat sheet, they get like super excited. Like, oh, I can use the cheat sheet for this. Um, and the cheat sheet literally was just like filled in notes for them. So that when they were watching their instructional video, they're engaging with that video um, with questions that are embedded in the Ed puzzle. And then they can really just focus on that. And then when it comes to their practice, then they can have the cheat sheet right in front of them. The notes are already filled out for them. Um, and so for our practice, we had them like reading little segments of text and using two different colored highlighters to highlight if the, if it was third person point of view, which characters thoughts and feelings do we know if it's only one character, if it's third person limited, then um, they would use only one color. And if it was third person omniscient, you would see two different characters, thoughts and feelings. And that was super helpful for our kids to kind of see and for us to kind of glance at their practice and be able to see, oh, they've identified this correctly. And they're able to um, figure out these things. And then, and then assessing that skill later on in our mastery check, they had already had the practice, the hands-on practice with using the text to support their answer. And then when they got to their mastery check, just being able to identify um, those things. Go ahead, Jack. No, I was just going to say, Elaine sort of touched on the colors and sort of like visually. One of the things I know that a lot of people ask, especially like have asked Elaine and I, like, how do you handle like all of that grading or like, how do you know? And when you, when we create a lot of our practices, we try to embed colors and things that were like, you can kind of like be standing behind them or kind of like watching them. And if, if the students screen is totally blank that's either telling you that they're confused I mean if you see a rainbow happening on their screen that kind of gives us the signal like okay we need to maybe go over and address this student and so much of the differentiation kind of it happens so 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 naturally because the students that really are able to pick up the skill and fly with it are are, are moving along at their pace which is not preventing them from getting to those aspire to do type of things which is really enriching their learning. Mm -hmm. I just, I love that example, Jackie and Elaine of the cheat sheet, and we're really kind of reducing the cognitive load. You know, we're saying like, we want you to focus on the video 
and the check for understanding questions and this cheat sheet is is here for you I yeah think. for sure especially this year sort of in this i know that we've all had a, a menagerie of different instructional requirements this year and so you know how could we ensure that they were that they had even the materials in their environment to to appropriately take the notes it was like we're going to give it to them and and uh, and then we were kind of like looked at these were like well why haven't we done this all along like it it made a big difference for our students the the low, our lower level students didn't have to worry about it and our upper level students were like sweet thank you for doing that it was you know i can focus on this video yep yep it's just like something so small can be so big um, yeah, I want to hear about this lesson. So another one, will we actually be watching a clip from a video from this one later? I really liked this one. Okay, Elaine, I'm going to let you take it, take it, take it away on this one too. Sure. So in this uh, lesson, we explored a chunk of the text, um, the exposition and initiating event, and really like our, our instructional videos for the Telltale Heart, we chunked the story out into, it's a very short story, as you probably know, it's only about three pages long, but we really chunked it out for them. And we really focused on specific sections of the story at a time, because the vocabulary level is very high level for some of our students. Um, and the story itself is kind of weird and kind of creepy. And so it's really like to, to be able to really dive deep and, and understand the content, I think was really helpful for the kids um, through some of these um, close reading activities. And so we used the, our textbook has awesome resources that kind of models um, a close reading of the passage. And so we incorporated that close read into our instruction for this lesson. Um, and then later on, Jackie and I, at, you know, at certain points of the story kind of came together and talked through a close read kind of modeling how we would talk through like this a little chunk of the story which was I think great for the kids and then the kids can do the same thing when they're working in their groups or working collaboratively then they can say you know here let's let's highlight this one paragraph or this one section of the story and have a conversation about it what is actually happening in this section of the story to really kind of allow for some of that conversation to pull out the essential um, information that they needed to know yeah so yeah. let's let's shift gears if you don't mind to talking about writing specifically. So we kind of talked about how you know in your case it was a shorter text, it was a very deep dive into that shorter text. Um, uh, let's talk about how you handled an essay in middle school with the modern classrooms model. Yeah, for sure. And we were we were definitely like, oh my gosh, you know, let's really think about this, like how how are we going to approach this? And 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 it it did. It took a little bit of thinking about, but then. Um, it really came together a million percent better than we could have ever imagined. So sort of like Alicia was saying earlier, we have a, you know, as much as we would like for them to be able to really express themselves, we're sort of pigeonholed with what our state requires them to be able to perform for their state assessments in terms of their writing and what their expectation is of what that writing will look like. And so they were focusing on this sort of expository essay the very classic style of essay, but it's really their first exposure to things like a thesis and how to elaborate with an anecdote. They had never even heard of the word anecdote before. They kept on calling it the antidote. And I'm like, no, we, no one has gotten bitten by a snake. We're not talking about that. And so um, what is a conclusion? You know, especially if you guys are, you know, out there all teaching, you, we know like all of a sudden they just like stop writing. I'm like, well, you, you can't just stop right there. Like what, <laughs> what is going to happen next? So like, why an inclusion a conclusion is important and you know what does it actually mean to revise not like I'm done I did the spell check I'm going to turn it in I'm like well have you actually like read it from the beginning to the end uh, because you might want to you know give it a look before you do that and then you know how do you transition between these things a lot of times these guys our kids have such fantastic ideas but it's like blah and it's all out on the thing and it's like trying to follow like I, I mean it's like oh my gosh you need to like okay, what are you going for? So how to use a transition to get from point A to point B to point C. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, really being able to add in that purposeful detail to su support any kind of main idea. And we found that we were able to really quickly identify some students who could become like peer writing mentors. And as soon as we shared their work and we were like, like glowing it up, like we would like to share, you know, such and such as essay today, they wrote a fantastic introduction and like that that child was like beaming and then we were like okay so if you are really struggling this is the person that you can like send a message to or like you know turn around and talk to obviously this year it's a little difficult to like do some of the clustered seating that we would maybe do in a different year but 
we really found that they were having very innovative, powerful conversations. Some of them were texting each other. And I was like, what are you doing? There's like, oh, I was texting him about my, had it, helping me with my thesis. And I was like, okay, text away, you know? So really, really, really building up their ability to do it was so, it, it paid it paid back tenfold. Mm -hmm. Oops, I went too far. <laughs> no, that's okay. So in this lesson, we talked about, um, it was an introduction to introduction. So we had a, a video that kind of walked them through um, what are the components of an introduction, you know, having your topic sentence, having your thesis statement, um, how to write a thesis statement, how to do a raft, um, and then planning out all of those things. And so we had some instructional videos that kind of connected with um, this little practice sheet where they were looking at some prompts, uh, actually prompts from our state assessment that they would have to write to, um, and then walking through those steps. So doing their raft, doing their brain dump, um, and then you know taking the pieces of the introduction and kind of at the end formulating their own introduction. And then the mastery check for this particular uh, lesson was actually going into their master document, which we created a master document for them to kind of continually go back to as they were working through the units. They're they writing their essay as they're working through the unit. Um, and so then their mastery check for this particular lesson was to go in and pop in and write their um, introduction paragraph. And then we had them color coding because we like, again, like Jackie said last time when we were talking about the other thing, um, it's really helpful I think for our kids visually to organize their thoughts um, and, and we teach them that color coding skill um, as we're working through all of these things. And so that way they know like, okay, the items that are in my thesis statement need to, you know, in the, be in the same order in my body paragraphs. Um, and so the, it's actually the example that we have up on the screen right now is a special ed student actually who wrote this essay and really did a beautiful job with it. And, and this is a student who in this model has really, really thrived because she's had the time to like go back and rewatch and take her time and revise as we've worked through this. So it's really neat to see. And then we also had this conclusion um, lesson. So we all, well, obviously we had body paragraphs and we worked through how to write anecdotes and things like that. Um, and this is another example of, you know, utilizing our instructional video to walk through the step by steps. Um, the do's and don'ts list really helps them to establish, you know, what is, what are the elements of this skill that um, they need to have. Um, and so we, we walk them through a uh, very short instructional video about that. And then we provide them with the cheat sheet once again, which you can see at the top of the screen. Um, and there's also a little do's and don'ts. And then for their practice, they actually evaluate real student conclusions that we pulled from anchor text. And so then they, they take a look at those conclusions and the questions that are in that mastery check um, or the practice, I'm sorry, are really focused on, you know, what what is this person doing right? What is this person not doing right? Refer back to your cheat sheet and take a look. You know, are you able to identify what they talked about in their essay? Are they introducing something new? Oh, that's not right. Can't do that. So those are the kinds of things that we really focused on in this lesson. Um, and then of course for their mastery check would be to go back into their master document, their essay document and type their conclusion paragraph. And since they've had, you know, not only the instruction on exactly what needs to be in there and then some practice evaluating other samples and then to be able to kind of as as models and then to be able to actually write their own it was really really helpful for our kids and all of our kids ended up going from you know really no knowledge of how to write a conclusion at all they would write the end <laughs> uh, to actually coming up with like these really phenomenal conclusions that really wrapped up their essays and it was really neat to see yeah, we, we said that we had really knew that we had achieved mastery across the board when we did not read one time. Thank you for reading my essay. I was like, <laughs> we did it. Elaine, we did it. No one wrote, thank you for reading my essay. <laughs> and my name is Joshua. The end. Yeah. <laughs> we introduced something new, you know, not the role of a conclusion, Joshua. Um, thank you so much for, for just for sharing some of that. I, oops. This is in the, let's dive deeper. Here we are. Yeah. I want to go into some of the questions and I see we've got some great questions coming into the chat um, and keep those up. But we did receive some um, when upon webinar sign up and a lot of them had to do with collaboration and discussion. Teachers were also asking about different uses for instructional videos in an ELA classroom. 
Um, and then kind of to the point where we'll continue our conversation on differentiation um, and then skill-based assessments. So we're just going to quickly overview how um, modern classrooms teachers kind of address the four of these, of these issues. So when it comes to collaboration and a discussion in a modern classroom in general, um, I think it's sometimes a misconception that people say like, oh, the students have to be, you know, they have to do the same thing. They have to, you know, do an instructional video every day, or they have to be on computers every day, or whole class activities are eliminated because we shift everything to a video. And that's not true. We might shift our direct instruction to a video, but we have very vibrant modern classrooms where people are, you know, are pulling together their students on um, whole class activities regularly, as well as doing, you know, small group discussions, partner work, et cetera, as you've heard left out tonight. So some best practices around, if you're interested in doing some type of whole class collaborative activity, um, maybe that's a speed dating activity, maybe that's a writer's workshop activity, maybe that's a seminar. Um, so just remember starting a unit with a collaborative activity can be really powerful for inquiry and convenient for your planning. Since we self-pace within a unit of study, you know, units will close. That is, you know, with age appropriate reminders, um, but that is that self-pacing with guardrails. And that's what we want to see, frankly. Um, it's inappropriate really for any student, you know, K-12, if we just say, you know, here's the year of curriculum, have at it, self-pace. Well, that's, we don't do that. Um, for several reasons, we self-pace within a unit. And when we can start a unit with a collaborative activity, again, two birds, one stone, good for the kids, good for our planning. Um, with If you're planning a collaborative activity in the unit, like you see on this game board, we have an all-class seminar, Monday, April 2nd, if you have A-Day, um, what we want to do is we want to publicize those dates to students in advance and give frequent reminders for those whole-class activities. We also want to plan our lessons, or those, those whole-class activities, rather, with cushion lessons or buffer room built in so all students can be engaged to participate. So we see here, leading up to our seminar on April 2nd, um, lesson three is actually a should do activity. If you're not familiar with this must do, should do, aspire to do, this is kind of our, our um, you know, how we differentiate really in modern classrooms. We talk about must do, should do, aspire to do lessons or tasks, so everyone is meaningfully engaged throughout a unit. Um, and then finally, it's great to build in discussion routines in your classroom that students can engage in daily. Um, so I know Jackie, Alicia, and Elaine have all lifted up ways that they're building in collaboration and discussion in their classroom. Um, and, but let's go ahead and talk about creative uses for instructional videos as well. So videos can be used for much more than explaining new content. This is frequently how we use videos, and I would say you know, our, our founders here at the Modern Classrooms Project, they were math teachers, and this was how they usually used instructional videos. However, um, we use instructional videos for all sorts of purposes, modeling good academic habits, um, such as guiding readers through a complex text, which we're going to see here in a minute, explaining a, con a complex process. Maybe you want to demonstrate how to add citations um, or inspiring independent inquiry. These are all things that we can um, that we can do through video. I'm actually going to show a quick clip of one of Alicia's videos um, where she is. Um, I would say you're you're modeling good academic habits and explaining a complex process in this video, Alicia. You circled the one side. These three reasons now become your first, your second and your third body paragraphs. Isn't that exciting? It sure is. Let's talk a little bit about it together. So I'm just gonna erase all of this so that, uh, you know, you're not distracted by it because I gotta get over some stuff. <laughs> what I love about this is it's your personality. It's you okay. and your kids so, know that. The first point that we have here, remember from our um, step up to writing, we have the peel strategy. So your first sentence in this paragraph is your topic sentence. You're gonna tell me what the point is, what you're going to be discussing for this particular paragraph. The second can be your explanation or your evidence. Remember that we can interchange these. We don't have to be married to them. And then your third paragraph is your link, your final thoughts on this topic. Now we had a little bit of practice of this when we did our step up to writing uh, 
lesson. So if you miss that, you need to go back and make sure you did it. I know that you can you couldn't have moved on without it, but some of you may have forgotten. So go back and take a look at it again. Um, and essentially, that's how. What I love so much about that is, you know, again, your personality is coming through, and it's something that the students can go back and reference. And that's just a, you know, so it saves your energy as the teacher again, rather than repeating the same instructions again and again. Your time is more meaningfully spent, really helping students one on one. Um, or in small groups. Um, Jackie and Elaine, I have to hand it to you for one of the most creative uses of an instructional video that I've seen yet. And I have seen a lot of instructional videos here at the Modern Classrooms Project. Um, but I think that this is just, I th I'd say you're also modeling good academic habits and explaining a complex process in this video. More and more excited. And he's, he's starting to feel like he really can hear this heartbeat. He feels like the heartbeat's getting louder and louder. And then he says, a new anxiety sees me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. Um, definitely not being heard by a neighbor, Mrs. Milton. I mean, I don't know anybody's heart that beats quite that loudly, but this man is totally paranoid about the sound and the reality of what this is actually happening like. And so nothing that he's saying is actually really true. We should not really be believing him at all. Mm -mm. Love the use of an mm. Ed Puzzle note. The next line says the old man's hour had come. Mr. Have you heard that before? You know, my grandfather used to say that all the time. And it's like a very old phrase, not super common, but if somebody tells you that your hour has come, you better look out because they might be out for you. AKA, they're ready to get you. All right, so then, okay, he throws open the lantern. What does that mean, mister, to throw open the lantern? Well, I mean, he's he's like filled with adrenaline, right? So when you're filled with adrenaline, you're just like totally going for it. And he's, remember, he keeps on telling us like he has this little- I love how, again, you're just modeling how the kids should be interrogating this text, how they should be engaging with it. Um, and I think this was this was such a good use of, of an instructional video. Um, so let's kind of, let's go back. Can I get a thumbs up if you can see my screen again? Successfully navigated that transition, great. Um, let's, I know we've hit on this a little bit with differentiation and Jackie and Elaine, you pointed out some of the ways that you have um, used the modern classroom instructional model to meet the diverse needs of your students in your ELA modern classrooms. But I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about some of what you've done in your classroom. Yeah, for sure. And so one of the things actually that we started to do was to build within, with, right into our mastery checks. So there's obviously like the must do of the mastery check, but then we've built in some like should do and aspire to do questions, which are those questions that like really require the students to do a little bit more thinking, a little bit more um, deeper dive into whatever it is that we're trying to assess. And they have the choice obviously to do, to participate in those or to not, but we found by like embedding them in, a lot of times that they'll just give it a shot because they're already working through it. And then they find like, oh, I actually like knew that. And so like, it really helps to build their confidence because it's not like a whole separate part of the lesson or a whole separate thing for them to begin. They're already, they're already working within that particular thing. Um, we definitely have provided some alternate texts. Uh, we have a fairly large ELL population. So sometimes, you know, it's not super accessible for our ELL emerging language, English language learners to be reading Edgar Allan Poe. And so we found some other texts where we could just really work in on the same skills. So that's why it's for us, it's super important to really utilize that backward design of like, okay, they need to leave this unit understanding and mastering these skills. And, and you know, at the end of the day, English has the great benefit of, of almost any text can be applied to any skill. So it's a matter of really finding the right one to match it up with and or something that would be appropriate for those particular learners. So, you know, feel free to alternate the text. If, if there's a group of kids that can be reading something a little bit more advanced and you want to really challenge them, this is the perfect way to do it. You could still assess that same skill. Can they do X, Y, and Z? But there's no reason why they have to read the same thing to do it. Um, we also have built in some instructional videos that provide an audio version of the text. And so I know for several of our students, um, they have an accommodation where things would be read to them. And so, you know, to a certain degree, 
every student loves to be read to. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to then be able to read it on their own, but it will, again, it will help to build their confidence. So we, we often provide an audio version of the text. Our, our textbook has a fantastic audio version kind of built in. It's, it's a semi-robotic voice sometimes. It's kind of like, uh, some are better than others, but like they, they will listen to us. They will sit there and listen to like, I don't know, us reading a chunked out video that they probably could have read maybe more efficiently on their own just because it's familiar and comfortable for them. So providing that audio version of text has been something that has been really helpful. It's been keep helps keep them, you know, on their own pace and, and so that they don't just give up like ah, I can't do this, you know, providing those little assistance points for them. And then the cheat sheets, which Elaine talked about um, while we were talking about uh, some of the things, but gosh, you call something a cheat sheet and hand it to them, they really are on board from the beginning. Um, this next one is just creating, you know, any opportunity to explore. And Alicia, I think that you um, can also speak to this one as well. Yeah, so one of the things that my PLC team was looking for for the last like year and a half is authentic engagement. So you, you, nobody wants to drag someone through something. And students have become very, uh, you know, jaded and, and disinterested in much of what you can teach, even if you're doing your best to make sure that it's relevant, it's reflecting their worldview, it's reflecting all of the different types of people and cultures in your room. So this creates an opportunity for organic ways for them to engage with the text and explore more um, related content that we may not be able to cover. So uh, I have a podcast from Seeding Sovereignty about food sovereignty, which was something I didn't really know about until I watched um, Pat uh Taste the Nation over the summer. I did some research on. And so kids who we talk a little bit about food and what it meant to our indigenous first nations, they can do more exploration. They can listen to the podcast. And then they're kind of doing a, a mini podcast video through Flipgrid for me about maybe something for the, from their culture that is, you know, they want to start to be more sovereign about or how they can get involved in indigenous food sovereignties. Um, and then understanding, understand that this model gives us the ability to serve the greatest needs of students and that self pacing alone provides a meaningful natural differentiation. So as I kind of tried to emphasize through my structure and I know, uh, Jackie was, they did a great job in terms of emphasizing for theirs, you get to be the master of your domain just, you know, for a Seinfeld quote there, but like you get to be the person who decides or I want to use this level text, like my 1700 plus Lexile girl in the back who's doing the International Science Fair text. There's this really great appropriate essay that kind of goes along with these skills. So I'm going to throw that at her because she's going to love this. And she already told me she read this other story in the eighth grade. Um, so while she's doing that, I can work with the student who has a lower Lexile level and make sure they're on pace. And that cloning of yourself is really just invaluable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about mastery checks um, a little bit more. And I see some questions in the Q&A um, about mastery checks, and we will definitely get to those here in a minute. But um, when we talk about assessing skill, um, uh, let's discuss a little bit. Jackie, do you want to walk us through what, what you and Elaine found with mastery checks? Yeah, for sure. And, and we've, we sort of found that one of the things... Um, you know, a mastery check does not have to always look like a Google form, multiple choice type thing. You just have to be very concrete about what the student needs to do or to how, what is it that they need to demonstrate to you that they could do to show mastery. And so um, if that's, you know, applying something or revising something or contributing to the larger final product, but also, you know, providing them with that rubric right from the get go of like, here is what you need to do to be able to demonstrate this. Um, that is also really invaluable, but then giving them the space to sort of explain their skill in a way that makes the most sense to them. You know, if they are in a person who could just like sit there and talk to me about it, but the, to, to type it into this box is going to be a struggle for them, then I'm just going to listen to them and be like, yes, they could do this skill. Um, it doesn't always have to look exactly the same for each student. And you'll sort of be able to really quickly figure out which ways are most efficient for your, your students by allowing them that opportunity. And then also, like I said, just including sort of what it is that they need to do, which is we use a lot of like, do, like looks like and does not look like. This looks like this, you know, mastery looks like this, non-mastery looks like that. And so that they can be like, oh, well, I've got like two of these, but like, I need to really be able to, to get all of the things on this side. Yep. 
just to add on to that, embedding rubrics into everything that we do makes it really easy for us to grade and provide commentary and feedback to the kids right away. It's super quick. So if there's a rubric right on this little activity and we can just highlight the one that they got and then they can just look and see, oh, I see what I need to do to improve my score on this in my revision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Modern Classrooms Project, again, to echo what we said in the beginning about teacher authenticity and teacher expertise. We trust ELA teachers to creatively apply the tenets of blended self-paced mastery-based learning to best serve their own students. I'm going to put a few resources in the chat before we get going with questions. Um, if you are interested, please check out um, our website we um just by now it's by no means all modern classrooms educators it's a tiny tiny handful of the teachers we work with but we have exemplar units up on the site in various grade levels and you can be able to find some other um ela examples and then if you are a facebook user we believe teachers again learn best from other teachers so why not head to facebook and ask other modern classrooms educators your questions if you're not a member of our Facebook discussion group, that might be a helpful place to have some of your questions answered to hear what other educators are doing. Um, so thank you for putting your questions in the chat. We'll go ahead and get started um, talking about um, a few of these. I'm curious. So Christy has a question about students who are unmotivated. So students who really should be doing the aspire to do's, um, but constantly hang back at the strive to do's. Um, I know I certainly experienced some of this in my classrooms and not a classroom and I had my own ways of dealing with it. I think all teachers do. Um, but Jackie, Alicia, Elaine, what would you say to Christy's question? One of the things I've discovered this particular year, and I wanna make very clear for everyone, we've been on virtual for most of the year. We went back hybrid end of February. Um, but one of the things I found is a lot of extrinsic pressure from students who may live near each other or are friends. Um, which is something that I haven't experienced before in classroom. There's a little girl for my students, they have a student facing pacer and they're different colors, which indicates where they are. And so a little girl walked downstairs in her apartment building to the other little girl's door, knocked on it and was like, how come you haven't done anything yet? What are you doing? We should be doing this Aspire to do together right now. How come we can't? That's just something that you can't pay for. Um, so lots of extrinsic positive peer pressure, but also, um, maybe just offering them the aspire to do i think jackie might have touched upon this giving them the aspire to do instead of the must do changing out that text and saying look you're too high level for this particular thing or you know maybe not using that exact language but try this story for me i want to do this group needs to do this story and this group needs to do this story and then you're still assessing the same skills but just with a higher level text yeah and i was just going to sort of also speak about that tracker and we use a student facing tracker we also often incorporate like a like for the just the student but it is a very motivating thing in our classroom and, and this year Elaine and I have legitimately combined our two classes of like 30 students so there's like 60 kids in some of these classes not all in person but it's it, they're a large group and so you know obviously nobody even our most unmotivated students all of a sudden when they realize you know everybody else is like way down there and i'm like still sitting up there if, if it's not self-motivated there is there has not ever been a case in our classroom where some very kind hearted student has not gone over to that kid and been like hey can i help you get started on this ed puzzle like let me show you where to find that and then the kid is like oh like this is not that hard and then like that you know if you have those kids that are not motivated moving them along like right away like allowing them to see their progress like I, this is an achievable thing so like sometimes even just like breaking it down like even smaller so they're like moving and they're like oh I can do this is really really helpful so I would say definitely using that tracking system and finding what works best like for you and your students but for us that has been super helpful for those unmotivated kids yeah and there's I mean we can we can talk about motivational strategies it's actually a part of the virtual mentorship course um we could, I'm sure we could keep talking about that, uh, that all night. Uh, in fact, I do think we have a podcast episode about that. So if you are a podcast listener, maybe check that episode out. Um, any best practices for using the modern classroom model with a whole novel? Um, what would we say about kind of the model with a, a, you know, reading the same text for a sustained period of time? I have found that, and again, virtually in this year, especially chunking really works for a larger text. And then having 
similar structures like the thematic journal where they're pulling the skill sets from the uh, text that you're looking for. And then you can have a mastery check for comprehension after that. So for my students, they have to do sections one through four. They turn that in and then we use Canvas as our learning management system. So after that one is done, the quiz will open up for them for quest, uh, for chapters one through four. And those are your basic comprehension characterization skills that I'm looking for um, for the students in total. And then you can kind of mix and match as you need along those ways. But I, I would find that chunkings is just, it's, it's essential for getting through a longer work. Um, and you can do like lots of different groups in terms of collaboration. We use K Kagan structures. I don't know what we're gonna do next year when we're actually in person, but we did like the four square groups and sometimes you can do like a jigsaw in that way as well. Um, if you wanna do like a whole group review. Uh, so those are a couple of things that I can come up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was just going to add to that, you know, even though it is a self paced classroom, that doesn't mean that there are not deadlines and due dates of things that they need to keep in mind. I think I think you just need to be upfront with them. So here is my expectation is that we are going to be to this point at, you know, in the novel by this particular date. And then if they're not meeting that like right from the get go, that's when I think that you then try to pull in some of your other teacher tool belt strategies of, you know, pulling that little group aside or sitting with that student. Those are the students who are going to just need you a little bit more than maybe the instructional video or their peers. And so, um, you know, but letting them know sort of those dates from the beginning and incorporating those into sort of like the calendar that you share with them um, is really, really helpful. This way, it's not just like, well, you know, here's the book and, you know, the final assessment is on this day. So kind of like, like Alicia was saying, chunking, uh, even with a short story is, is really a, a helpful strategy. Yeah. Um, one quick thing to Julie's question about novels that I will point out on the exemplar site is um, an, um, it's a study of the novel Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, I believe for sixth graders. Um, so you can, and in that she did a lot of, of uh, work with focal scenes um, in that particular novel. So that might be a helpful example to check out. Um, so it's interesting because Jackie, you just talked about deadlines. We still absolutely have deadlines in the self-paced classroom because you know the means and self-pacing is a means to the end, which is mastery. Um, you know, that's why we're doing this. And of course, students are not robots. So mastery is going to come when we can self-pace. Um, and so I love that you lifted that up. It kind of, um, I think, feeds with Denise's question of how do we handle the timing of work so that the units end all together and students together at the end of the unit. I'm curious um, what we've kind of learned along the way of constructing units so our students are self-paced within a unit, but most of our students have, you know, they can complete, they've completed the work and we can go on to the next unit as a class. Yeah, for sure. Um, Elaine, do you want to talk a little bit about how we used some of our expert like student writers to help the struggling ones, you know, push them along to get there by the end? Sure. So we would create, especially like in this virtual environment, like creating breakout rooms or if you were just in the classroom, like have those kids work together. So those kids that were you know, had moved along, had mastered a, a specific skill, could then go back and, and sit literally and work with some of those other students who were struggling and, and kind of try to get them caught up. Um, and we would also, Jackie and I would create, and, and our um, special ed colleague who also works with us for some of our classes would do breakout rooms as well to kind of pull kids up and, and work with them one-on-one -on -one to, to sort of um, streamline them through the process and try to get them um, going. So yeah. Yeah, there's definitely always going to be some stragglers, but Alicia? Yeah, no, same thing. Just to add to that, um, you know, very clear deadlines, making sure everyone knows our county policy is two weeks for all assignments. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure that the weeks are listed on my unit pacing plan very clearly. The expectation is very clear, you know, for lesson one is do the suggested deadline is this day, the hard deadline is this day. And then like uh, both, both these ladies said, grouping, pairing, and collaboration is really key. This model is fantastic in person, and it does work well in a virtual structure, especially if you're doing a breakout room. Um, those kids 
will organically work together. And then you can always sit with the group that you know is struggling or the couple of kids that are struggling, they kind of stay behind with you and you can help motivate them. But as Kate had mentioned, there is a very clear, realistic deadline. Deadlines are important, they're real. Don't pay your water, don't pay your cell phone, don't pay whatever, they're shutting your stuff off. So we have to remember to respect those organically until our society changes where there is no time. Uh, and we just kind of get used to implementing those items within the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, David, I promise we're going to get to your question. I do not mean to skip you again, but Alicia, while you have the floor, um, you, I know you've taught in a four by four block schedule at the high school level. Um, I'm curious for Kelly's question, what you would say about a reading and writing workshop model um, within the four by four. So it, it was a, a shock to us. We have never done it before. Um, and then the county had said, this is how we're going to be doing the school year. So it was a bit nerve wracking, but I found that uh, breaking things up into smaller units um, and giving them combined deadlines really helps. So that suggested deadline or that lesson um, game board that we're referring to when you're in the modern classroom project, you kind of learn how to self pace your own content. What's gonna work best in this particular time frame. So for a reading and writing workshop, if you're working on analysis and the application of that skill in terms of creation, you can start a kid, your student, your group, reading a certain story and doing the analysis and then sprinkle within those items parts of the essay or parts of the final writing project or the skill set for the writing project. You can do it alternately, or you can do one whole module on just the reading items and mastery checks that are smaller that may reflect some of the writing items. Um, but really having a structured outline with those due dates is going to help. And in a four by four schedule, you're working in a compressed time. So one of the things we had to really just make peace with is that you're not going to be able to hit all the things that you want to. So you start really looking at your work. What's most essential? What are the skills that are most essential that they need to accrue and get? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, David, I'm really sorry. Now back to your question. Uh, <laughs> after I skipped him twice, um, let's talk about mastery checks. Um, we kind of talked about it a little, but this idea of are they, do they have to be multiple choice, a full on short answer, test a two to three question exit ticket or something different. So as a best practice for mastery checks, um, you know, if we're teaching it, we should assess it, right? Um, so we want to see, you know, that we have a mastery check. And I always kind of look at this as my litmus test, as my pulse check, uh, a checkpoint, if you will, can a student go on? Um, so I want to, I, but I, I don't want this to be a bottleneck in the classroom. So I want to make sure that my mastery check is aligned um, with this, with this, um, you know, the content of the lesson, obviously. And I want to make sure that it's criterion referenced, non, non norm referenced, um, and that it's something that I can get through relatively quickly and the student can too. Um, so you know, you'll find several examples of mastery checks if you go to the exemplar unit. Um, so I wouldn't say we'd want to do something test length or anything like that, you know, um, and and mastery checks can look different for different lessons. You know, sometimes we can do oral mastery checks with students. Um, um, I know sometimes with students, I, you know, particularly, uh, you know, I saw students excel on sortable mastery checks if, you know, if I wanted them to work with, you know, the structure of a body paragraph for instance, as a, as a history teacher, as you know, the, what I'm, I'm, the, I'm the cousin, I'm the little sister of English. I'm not sure where social studies teachers fit in, but um, I might have, you know, the mastery check is some sort of sortable, like where would I put the thesis statement? Where would I put the general statement, et cetera? Um, so, you know, they can take many, many forms. I think we just want to make sure again, aligned criterion referenced and that um, this is not going to create too much of a bottleneck for ourselves and the students. Um, what are different Different things. And I feel like ELA is so fun because we see mastery checks take so many different forms. Um, like Jackie and Elaine, you talked about um, the mastery check being part of the larger mastery document that would, con that, you know, the essay would ultimately um, be. Um, uh, and what else are we doing, you know, in terms of mastery and mastery checks in our rooms? What am I missing? 
had one that was like Elaine and Jackie's when we were prepping for the SOL. So we were doing, you know, uh, just specific instruction, very centered instruction for certain parts of the essay every day. And I did um, some anchor conclusions from papers of yesteryear and their mastery check was to correct it. So your job was to copy paste it onto your Google document and to correct it. And then you were gonna write me a better one than the student using the PowerPoint that we had in class. So you can see like a finite, yeah, uh, application of skill. Um, they have done TikTok videos for me. They have done some Snapchat videos for me, applying skills uh, for students who are a bit more creative. Uh, they're more kinesthetic. They're better with an oral explanation of items. Um, am I missing anything, friends? What else we got? No, I was going to say between you know, between what Kate said and then what you just said, and even David, even your ideas in the in the question itself, those are all great ideas. I mean, I think you just can can really look at whatever it is and, and sort of adapt it to whatever you know is going to be the easiest thing for you to assess to say, yes, this kid has it. No, here's what you need to go back and review before you, you know, come back to me again. Um, at the off the top of my head, I can't think of anything particularly that we've done that was like super different than any of those. Elaine, am I no, I just wanted to add that like having things that self grade like for little things like for short things are are awesome so like the you know we use a lot of Google forms. Um, and have the you know uh, answer key embedded in there whatever and it self grades and we're our uh, learning management system is Google classroom this year. Um, and and it just literally like uploads their score right into that so that's also super helpful too for like some of those quick checks skill checks as well. I think it's important to note, though, that uh, one of the things that's kind of disconcerting about this program is the freedom and the flexibility to create what works best for you, because we're so used to people being like, you got to have it this way with this many things. And you're like, oh, I could do whatever I would like. That's amazing. We trust you. Teachers, teachers are brilliant. Teachers are smart. Let teachers be teachers. Yeah. Yeah, and David, you're totally right. It's not the final test. It's the little checks along the way so that when they get to the final, when they get to that big thing at the end, they already know that they're going to do well on it because they've already like mastered seven or eight things along the way to get there. You know, um, if you're thinking about something, especially I know we focus a lot on writing and, and sort of reading something longer, like they already have demonstrated that they've been reading and understand that story because of all the things that they've been doing beforehand, or they already have like, you know, three quarters of that essay or that, that longer story written before they get to that final thing. So it's really those really concrete checkpoints along the way. Like you can't really move on to this step B until you've mastered step A type of things. Yeah. I think mastery checks, I like to think of them as bite-sized assessments. Did this kid get this objective? Yes. No. If no, that's okay, we've got time to revise. And while the student next to them got that objective, they can go on to the next lesson. Um, kind of finally gives us that flexibility. Um, Megan, I'm gonna put a resource in the chat since your question is also about grading. Um, mastery checks translate into actual grades in many, many different ways. Um, and I would say if you talk to 10 modern classroom teachers, you're gonna get 10 different answers about what they grade and how they grade it. Um, it's difficult for us as a national nonprofit, you know, with different districts having different um, emphasis on their grade books, different weights for different items in the grade books. It's difficult for us to provide you know, uniform guidance, but I wanna put this example in that um, talks about how various educators K through 12 um, grade their items in a modern classroom. I hope that that might provide um, a little bit of clarity. Um, let's talk about, oh, I love this question. We've, we've mentioned um, the progress tracker many times. We have public facing trackers. We have student facing trackers. Um, Phyllis asks, how long do you, and I love Phyllis's question. She's talking about like directly teaching the, you know, cause we do, we, do, we, we teach, we model it, we message it in, in certain ways. So how long did it take you to teach your routines and procedures um, with self-pacing and the um, public and or student facing trackers specifically? This particular year we had to do like a unit zero. And so it was like lots of getting to know you stuff. So kind of took a lot of time to put together like these seal lessons for kids. So I just took that and I turned it into a modern classroom. 
thing. And it was kind of like, this is before they started that it was, this is your introduction to how you're going to learn. So we do an intro video it, introducing the students and the parents to what the structures of the classrooms are going to look like. Um, and I sent that out to all my parents and my students then had to watch it. And they did a small mastery check there, David, it was three multiple choice questions um, just to make sure that they read it. And then at the end of that, like unit zero, they took a Google form for me. How comfortable did you feel going through this model? What are some things you still have questions about? So it literally took me that one unit to get them introduced to the pacing and the flow of what a modern classroom is going to look like. That's not to say that when they don't walk in, I don't have music playing, that we aren't going to be doing a whole group instruction for grammar, that we aren't going to be talking about what events or announcements are coming up in the school, but just specifically for the modern classroom itself, it only really takes them in the high school level at what I'm teaching about one unit to kind of get it with smaller incremental things along the way. Most of the things that I'm really correcting are like, but for real, I can hand this in again, but like I, I get a whole new grade. Like you mean that, is that for real? That's usually what I'm dealing with more so than, than not. Yeah, and I was gonna say in the, at the middle school level, um, I think it's a lot of like just, you know, showing them what our expectation is. Like when you are over here and if you think about like the physical setup of your classroom, which I know this year was like, forget that. Just think about like, you know, moving forward, right? And so, you know, when you are in this part of the classroom, this is what I expect you to be doing. Like this is where everybody goes to listen to their instructional video. So like, we're gonna be quiet when we're over here because if you're at the stage where you're collaborating, you're on the other side of the room. And so I think sort of like, setting up your room in a way that's like functional depending upon whatever your room setup is like but then also that the kids immediately know you know the same way that they like when they need scissors they know where to get them you know there's not they're not interrupting you for those things because that is what you know would drive me completely bonkers but also those are the things that they can very easily master like I know last year we spent like I think we literally spent like 30 minutes and it was like, okay, when I'm moving from this part of the room to this part of the room, I am not going to touch anyone on my way, turn off somebody's laptop because I'm walking by and I'm going to slap it closed. I'm not going to kick their backpack. And so like, I was like, okay, now we're going to, we're going to practice moving. And they were like, are you serious? I was like, yes. And if you don't do it right, we're going to practice it again. And so like, they knew that like, we were kind of like playful, but like, this is my expectation and we're going to do it until we get it right. And then, the, and then you're going to hold each other to it. And so we call it we called it like our expectations and 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 then they were you know kind of responsible for holding themselves and each other accountable for doing that mm -hmm. yeah i i really love that um kind of and then elena i promise we're gonna get to yours next but on this topic of self-pacing um d megan asks do you have multiple self-paced units going on at the same time for example a literature writing unit a grammar unit and a vocab unit or do you meld them all together so i found that like too much is always too much but you can do minier units, as I like to call them. Uh, so I made reference to the fact that my students come in, we do grammar. Grammar is a real big uh, emphasis in terms of writing because I can't have a student correct their verb tense if they don't know where the verb is in the sentence. Uh, so we do eight basic parts of speech, sentence typings, all the way up to, you know, just some maybe like minimal high level stuff. Uh, so when they come in for me as a whole group, it's a nice way to kind of ground the classroom. We'll do our five to 10 minute uh, grammar lesson via Nearpod, which is nice uh, because they're all focusing kind of on the same thing. And uh, then when we're done with that and they've done their mastery check for that, which will be producing something for what it was, verb tense, they're going to highlight all the verb tense and the Ed Sheeran lyric that I pulled out and they're going to get extra points if they're the first one to tell me who the author, whatever. Uh, and so then we're going into the larger unit of the day, which is the reading stuff. And then you can kind of end the class with maybe something a little smaller. If you want to do like a quick write. So those are some ways you can kind of embed multiple units, but I would, I have never done like three big things at the same time, because like I said, too much is too much. And a lot of them can't focus on that many things going on at the same time. Yeah, no, for sure. And and I was going to um, say that Elaine and I have a similar, we um, try to see like what types of things would naturally blend within the unit. So like, you know, when we were doing point of view, we did a little mini part of one of the lessons is about like quotation marks and punctuating them because we were talking about like, quote, like direct speech within a text. And so like, sometimes you could insert some of those like really direct and specific grammar lessons, which sometimes feel like, well, they don't connect to anything, you know? And so, um, 
try, trying to like squeeze them in in ways that seem sort of natural or that the kid could then apply, you know, your students can then apply in a mastery check, you know, maybe they're writing and then they're demonstrating both things. They're explaining something from the text, but they're also using comma rules appropriately for, you know, whatever it is that you're showing them. I just put a link in the chat. I love this idea of like uh, some of these skills being ongoing and daily opportunities to that something. So we might be doing a larger unit on X, but we can still revisit Y um, through I, the, the video in the chat, I do not mean that to be, I do not mean it to be shameless self-promotion. It is, it's me talking about how I did a daily discussion in my self-paced classroom. And a lot of times it might be something like an ongoing skill in social studies that might be grammar, it might be math work, frankly. Um, and um, it, that could be kind of a helpful, a helpful exercise for something like grammar or a skill that you're going to use throughout the year if you don't want to dedicate a specific unit to it, um, but you do want to embed it along the way in your modern classroom. Um, so Elena's question about how do we do, um, um, how would you do a mastery check for oral components? Um, I know one thing that I've seen being done in classrooms I've visited is um, students would just, if, you know, they needed to, they needed FaceTime with the teacher, you know, it's just back before COVID. Um, uh, we were all in classrooms, crowded classrooms, but they might sign up on the whiteboard. Um, you know, they might indicate like, I'm ready for my mastery check, add their name. And the teacher, you know, while this was lesson three, let's say, was an, or was an oral mastery check. Um, so while the teacher, after she finishes grading or helping so-and-so, she can then look, okay, yep, you're ready. Let's do this. You know, come on over here. Another, um, a couple other things that you might want to do is I've seen teachers also use Flipgrid uh, for that too, or Canvas video, just as an opportunity where we might say, she might, the teacher might say, all right, um, you know, submit this via Flipgrid, go on to the next lesson, and I will give you feedback on this this evening. Um, or um, another option can also be really to use student peers uh, so they can give each other feedback. You could even have students, if, you know, if you're in that place in the year and if you think that your students can handle it, they could sign off on each other. Or one thing I like to do sometimes is I'd have my mastery check czar, um, which is a history teacher, gave me a fun uh, opportunity to teach the word czar. Uh, and uh, you know, they might say, all right, you know, uh, Ron is the mastery check czar. All mastery checks have to go to Ron before coming to me. So with an oral component, it might be kind of a, a nice way for them to, to practice with a student who is, you know, on those aspired to do tasks far ahead before they come to me. Um, is there anything that you'd add, Elaine, Alicia, or Jackie? I would just make sure that they had a very clear rubric in front of them so that they knew for sure what it is if you have, you know, your, your, your mastery czars or your TAs for the day or whoever is grading it, they understand what they should be looking for. Um, and I think that really just sets the expectations for everyone. It just makes it very clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let's see. And then how do we handle, um, how do we handle class discussion if too many students have not completed the must-dos before the date of your discussion? I know for me, my first year of implementing the model, I did learn a lot about pacing. And um, I might say like, right, well, you know, frankly, my, my timing was off, frankly, and that's, that's okay, you know, all right, we're gonna have the discussion on X day instead. Um, there, there was a time where I, you know, my, that's the great thing about teaching, we always get another shot at it. Maybe it's next period, next unit, next year. Um, so sometimes those adjustments with pacing um, are natural. Um, but I'm curious, I think other things that we can sometimes do if, if these were, you know, if these were, if these expectations were sound, um, I'm curious, I have a few things that I might do in my classroom to ensure that students can participate in a discussion if they do not complete must do activities. Um, but I'd like to turn this one over to our panelists first. I was going to uh, jump in and say that, you know, obviously you're not going to have an effective discussion if no one is prepared for it, but the likelihood is that, that there are going to be that core group of students that very much are. And so if you notice right from the get go, you know, a lot of our kids are not, are, a lot of your students are not ready. I would really then turn, 
turn that over to the students who are and have them, you know, be like, a, like a, we're going to do a blitz learning here, guys. And here's, here's going to be your coach. And it's going to be, you know, one of these students. And then I would probably be like, okay, you're going to all create your own cheat sheet. And we're going to make like some really important talking points that you could then keep in front of you. Because even the kids who are prepared, especially in middle school, um, get nervous for things like that. So like even our most prepared students would be like, uh, uh, uh. And so, okay, everyone gets, you know, everyone gets an index card, everyone gets one sheet of paper, write down some notes for yourself that you can keep in front of you and really put stars next to the ones you know you could do and, and then ask your, you know, your, your peer teacher for some tips about that. That might be some way that I would might, if it was really a day, when I, if it was like something we had to do that day, if I noticed that really everybody was struggling, I might, you know, take a, take a step back and sort of reflect, did I maybe not give them enough time? Maybe we all need a day today you know, this is what we're, our goal is going to be in the next class year. Here's my expectation for what, you know, you're coming in prepared for. And Elena and I have done that sometimes where we're like, okay, like this is not going to go the way that we had anticipated. So like that sort of, you know, in the same way that you would probably think on your feet for certain other things, but that might be one way in the moment that I would run across and be like, Elaine, I think we need to do this. <laughs> This kind of reminded me, or Jack, your story reminded me of, of a Kagan strategy that they had where you give everybody like a little note, a uh, sticky note, and they start by writing down one major plot point, one big thing in the tech, you know, whatever, whatever your discussion is going to be about. And then they have five minutes to run around the classroom and they get five other points that they have to get from someone else, but they can't have the same thing as the other person. So you have to find someone else who has a different, maybe like characterization or, or thought of a theme that we haven't covered yet in the text. It forces them to kind of interact with each other. I truly did not think that this was gonna work at all. And you wanna see some 16 year old sprint over some backpacks and whatever else was on the floor. And everybody was so excited to get this tiny little cheat sheet that they could talk to themselves. And yes, I'm sure it is very true that, you know, middle school kids get very nervous, but so do 16 year olds, they're like, uh, but then they have that little cheat sheet to kind of look off of. So that's a fun little strategy that engages everyone and that gets everyone on the same level. And just as everyone else on this panel has said, sometimes you just have to, you know, revise the timing. Sometimes things are going on, you cannot control in life. Maybe your, you know, evil math teacher co counterpart over there that the kids have is just being real hard with, and they were all up late, you know, it, that's okay. That flexibility is okay. Yeah, so um, one big thing, and I'll, we'll get to this last question here in a minute, but I do want to pass along some resources um, for any educators who are willing, who are wanting to learn more about the modern classroom instructional model. Our website is obviously a great place to start, and it's there that you can access all the professional development opportunities. If you haven't gone through the free course and strongly encourage you to do that, um, might help make sense of kind of some of these self-pacing structures we're talking about, how we plan for this, what mastery looks like, et cetera. Um, free course will always be there, learn.modernclassrooms.org. You can see here, I've put in the chat links to our podcast, as well as if you're quite familiar with the modern classroom instructional model, how you can apply to be a distinguished modern classroom educator like Jackie, like Alicia, like Elaine. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. And I see there was just one more question in the chat that I wanted to get to. First, I did answer a question um, just by putting a link in that question and answer, but it might be helpful. I'll toss it in here too. If you're wondering how um, Modern Classrooms Educators Start class, this is me again. It's just one example though. It's by no means the way you have to do it. But we find that for self-pacing, it's very powerful for students to do a couple things. One of those is to set goals for that day. Another is to articulate, frankly, where they are in this unit. And where is that in relation to a target or you know, pace lesson? So you know, we, we see the question in the chat about creating a pacing guide or lesson plans if students are going at their own pace. Well, the goal of a modern classroom, just like I like to think all classrooms, is mastery. You know, we want our students to be authentically learning, to be to authentically be making progress. And self-pacing is a means for them to get there. Um, since we have, you know, we have very real pressures, you know, we are, we are teachers with, you know, we've heard, you've heard the Virginia SOLs multiple times, um, as a teacher in the District of Columbia, I had my own standards, 
Uh, and we want, you know, we want to be able to cover more than one unit of study per school year. So as the teacher, it's perfectly appropriate for us to set deadlines for units, to set expectations of how we can meet those deadlines. You know, and of course, as educators, we're going to be building scaffolds along the way um, and doing all those great interventions that we do as teachers if students do fall behind. Um, so, you know, as the educator, definitely claim that power um, to say, you know, I want my students to complete this unit. And these are the benchmarks that we're going to have to see to get there. And this is where we should be in terms of timing, um, kind of, again, backwards planning and adding some dates in there, too. But it is powerful if the students themselves um, can get to track their own progress, not only just for helps alleviate confusion um, as they're walking into the classroom, um, but it's also powerful in helping them build some self-regulation. Uh, you know, we want to enhance those executive functioning skills in our students of all ages. Um, so anything like what you're seeing um, doesn't have to be the weather check do now, like you see in the chat and with that, with that Edutopia video. Um, Anything where you're asking students to articulate where they are in reference to where they should be is a powerful way to open class. Um, I want to thank you, uh, the teacher, the my favorite people are teachers. Um, thank you for coming out with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. And my biggest, biggest thanks to these all-star ELA teachers Distinguished Modern Classroom Educators, Modern Classroom Mentors, Jackie Dora, Alicia Cordero, Alicia, Elaine Milton, thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I believe teachers learn best from other teachers, so I am so proud to be able uh, to be learning from you on this webinar and to highlight the great work you're doing in your classrooms for kids. So thank you, everyone. Um, you know, we know this has been a long school year. Please sign off, get some rest. You're almost to summer. This is our last, um, this is our last pedagogical webinar of the school year. Um, but you can, you know, you can join us for virtual summer institute or um, please, you know, check your email, check your social media. We'll be back next school year with lots of new and exciting webinars starting in August. So please take care. And if I don't talk to you before summer, oh my gosh, get some rest. You deserve it. Oh. <laughs> Bye everybody.